going to be continuing our series on Devoted, and um, hopefully that'll come up in a moment. But today we're going to talk around our lives being devoted to God in a way that causes our hearts to surrender to Him in absolutely every way. When we choose to follow Jesus, the choice that we make is simply this, my life no longer belongs to me, but to Him. My life is no longer my own. Oh, wow, that is awesome. Sorry, I've just got blown away because I have, I have my presentation there and my notes there. Like, that is a miracle. <laughs> Praise Jesus. <laughs> now, if you could make it a little bit bigger so I could read it. No, no I can't. I can't read it. I can't read it. It's great. Thank you, Rico. How do I scroll? Do you, do you just scroll for me as I read it? That's awesome. You guys are amazing. That is awesome. Before, before we really get saying, uh, low wrong quest. Are you here this morning? I heard that you snuck in somewhere. There you are, low. How are you? Fantastic. So, so my friend, low, who is a dynamic minister of the gospel, just moves in great power and authority. And he's been in Switzerland preaching up a storm and doing some amazing things. Is that right? You just come back from Switzerland? Yeah. Awesome. We don't miss, I, me and the Lord, we like this. No, I'm just teasing. I've been following you on Facebook, Lo, and uh, someone said that you were here this morning. So can we just honor a man of God, a man who's given his life to the gospel? It's good to have you, Lo. Hearing about all the miracles and the signs and wonders, that's amazing. So we're going to continue our series about devoted. And so I just wanted to encourage you, your life doesn't belong to you anymore. It really does belong to God. And that becomes a very difficult thing to navigate in this world that constantly tells you to do what you want. We live in a world where we're constantly encouraged to do whatever you want to do, to live how you want to live. And as Christians, we go, okay, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to try. I, was, I read an interesting quote by, um, by a, a Christian a philosopher, and um, I just can't remember his first name now, Schaefer, and he said that whatever the world does to his horror, seven years later, you will find the, the church doing. And when I read that, I thought, oh gosh, do the philosophies of the world seep into the church? And the more they seep in, the, the more powerless we become, and the more self-centered we become, and the more, the, the more actively we pursue our own desires and our own agenda. And that's a dangerous, dangerous place. Because friend, your life does not belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. See, we don't understand that very well because we live in a democracy. Hey, nothing happens to me in this country without it being my will. Somebody gives me a hard time, I'm going to phone the police. We, we don't know what it is to live a life in absolute surrender to an authority. It's a contradiction of our democracy because democracy gives you the right to question everything. It's just not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying, friend, your life does not belong to you. It belongs to Jesus. And so as we look at this word devoted in Acts 2 verse 42, and we had a look at the Greek understanding of this word, the word means to move towards strength. What strengthens our lives? What makes us more in God? What strengthens us in Him? It's a move towards His will. It's a move towards His way. It's a move towards doing things as He commands. His way is always going to be better than our way. We, we can, you know, if we were betting people, we could make that bet, eh? God's way or that person's. We'll go with God. We're going to get our money back. Because His way is always better than ours. So um, I use this as an illustration. A couple of years ago, Dylan and I were watching TV, and um, my son just loves animals. Any kind of animal, he just loves animals. Maybe not snakes, but they can't be considered an animal. They're family of the devil. Um, so, <laughs> uh, all right, so I apologize. If you're a snake lover, please don't send me an email. It was a joke. I'll just give that out. Now, if you keep snakes, you're on your own. I mean, Jesus loves you. And, uh, <laughs> so he... He loves animals. And so we were watching this, this, uh, this documentary on National Graf Geographic or Discovery. I can't remember in particular. And so it was um, a group of researchers in Australia 
who were studying turtles. And what they found was that these turtles, uh, many turtles were being washed ashore. They were being washed ashore, and they, were, they, they weren't doing well. They were sick. They were dying. They found many turtles that had been hit by boats, and they were like, what's going on here? And so they began to dig a little deeper and do some research. And what they found was they found that turtles have a disease that causes them to create a lot of gas inside of their bodies, underneath their shells. And so what would happen was they would contract this disease, they would make a lot of gas, and then what would happen is they wouldn't be able to dive down. And so turtles generally feed on the bottom of the ocean. There's grasses and seaweeds and all kinds of things that they would go down and eat, shells and mussels and all those kinds of things. And so they weren't able to dive and they weren't, be, weren't able to feed. They weren't able to go deeper, and so they were starving. But not only that, was that on the top of the water, they were left vulnerable. They were left vulnerable to passing ships that would, that would knock them and break their shells and cause them injury. They'd be vulnerable to floating lines and nets, and they'd be caught up. And because they couldn't dive, they were at the mercy of the currents, and so they were being washed ashore. All because they were filled with this gas. And I began to think about that picture. I thought, wow, that, that's a picture of sin in our lives. Hey, the, the, the metaphor is as we go deeper with God, we feed on the stuff at the bottom. Hey, As we go deeper with God, we sense His presence more. Our lives are changed and transformed. As we go deeper with Him, something changes so radically for us. And when we're down at the bottom feeding, we can't be swept aside by the currents. We, get, we can't get tangled up in the affairs of life. Hey, and we certainly won't get run over by a boat. You see, you and I were created to live close to the Father, live in close proximity to Him. We were, we were created to live our lives with Him. And so the pursuit of our strength is the pursuit of moving towards the Father, to live intimately with Him, to live closely to Him. So can you scroll up my notes there? Is that possible? Because that would be amazing. Is that trying? And, and, so, and so we live with this this thing in our lives that keeps us from God. So um, I remember years ago, in fact, Rico preached this message. The first time I ever heard this and I went and studied it out was, was Rico. Many years ago at Life Church. And he spoke about worship. Is it there? Oh, no, can we go back to devoted? Those notes. We should actually practice this during the week, hey? Yeah, we, we'll do that. We'll do that. And we'll stop having a conversation. But Ricker preached a sermon about worship. And he, he said the first time the word worship had ever been used was used with Abraham. And Abraham took his son Isaac up onto a mountain to sacrifice him, to, to do as the Lord had commanded. And when he was making this journey, he had took a donkey and some sticks and a knife and all these kinds of things and servants. And when they got to the place that they would sacrifice Isaac on top of the mountain, he said to his servants, you guys stay here. Me and the boy, we're going up the mountain to worship. That doesn't look like worship. That looks like sacrifice. And that word worship in the Hebrew is quite amazing. It means to deflate. It means to deflate. It means to lie flat on the floor before the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful picture? A picture of surrender. A picture of, Lord, it's all about you. You know, we use idioms like full of hot gas. And we're not referring to um, <laughs> flatulence issues. We're talking about being puffed up, arrogant and prideful, hey. And that's what sin does to us. Sin puffs us up. It makes us arrogant. It keeps us buoyant. So we can't submerge. We can't go down deeper with God. Our pride keeps us floating on the top. And God says to you and I, our lives were created for Him. To serve Him. So a move towards God looks like a move towards strength. It's a move towards surrender. God, your will, your way. I want to remind you of a couple of things very quickly. This is Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. It's out of the message. It says this. It says, because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, pointing to Jesus, the beautiful one, the just one. It says, His blood poured out on the altar of the cross. What a beautiful picture. The altar of the cross. We're a free people. We are a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds. Another translation says our rebellion. It says, and not just B, 
barely free either. Abundantly free. Abundantly free. Isn't that beautiful? So I shared the scripture this morning to remind you that Jesus has set you free. He's made you free. He set you free. This is the same scripture in the New Living Translation. It says it this way. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Wow. I want to remind you this morning that the death of Christ and His resurrection was so that you and I could be free from sin. Abundantly free. Big time. Free because of Jesus. See, all of us had offense towards God, rebellion towards God. All of us were like that floating turtle. Not such a lack of picture, hey? (laughs) And we couldn't get down. We couldn't, we couldn't understand God. We couldn't know God. We couldn't feed on God. And we were left to the mercies of the enemy to be destroyed, to be ripped from God. But God is merciful in his great love towards us. Look at this scripture in Daniel chapter 9. This is the Old Testament. I love this. It says, but the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. So what did God give us for our sin? What did he give us for our rebellion? His son. His son murdered on the altar of the cross. His life poured out for you and I. God's response, his eternal response to your sin and mine, to your rebellion and mine, was to forgive us in his son. In Jesus, grace and mercy have found its home in you. Grace and mercy have found its home in you. That is what Christ accomplished for us. He forgave us. And so forgiveness, forgiveness is what catalyzes redemption. The giving and the receiving of forgiveness brings about the grace of redemption. The grace of redemption. So um, the power of sin is in its secrecy. The hiding in it. The hiding away. So that's whenever we talk about sin, it's always a dark thing. Uh, Something like that. But the power of redemption is in its confession. It's us declaring something. So God declares out of heaven, you are forgiven. You are abundantly free. I've washed you from your sin. Our response is, oh my goodness, thank you. I receive your forgiveness. I receive that from you, Father. And then the Bible says here in Hebrews 10, 17, quoting the Old Testament, says this. It says, I will never, God speaking, I will never, I've highlighted never because I want you to be aware of the fact that God will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. Wow. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, if you're going to clap for that one, you better clap. Because, Wow. You think about your sin more than God does. You are more conscious of your sin than God is. And it's a terrible thing. Because like I've said before, focus creates blindness. So if you're focused on your sin, you can't ever live in your freedom. If you're focused on all that you have done wrong, you will never be drawn into living right. If you keep on focused on the things of your past, you will never know a future. You have got to receive for yourself what Christ has done, that you are forgiven. And your sin and lawless deeds, he will remember no more. God makes that choice. He chooses to count you worthy. I read the most wonderful quote from Spurgeon. And, uh, and um, I'm, I'm probably going to mess it up in, in telling you because I didn't plan to, to do it. But uh, Lawrence Lemmer put it on his Facebook page. So sometimes Facebook is useful. And um, so I read this scripture. And, uh, and, and um, Spurgeon said these words. He said, we get to stand before God like Christ. Because Christ stood before God like us. He stood before the Lord in our sin and our rebellion. The Bible says when he hung on that cross, he was made sin. 
so that you and I may be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Wow. Wow. Jesus, we get to stand before the Father as the Son, as Christ. Because Christ stood before the Father as us. So powerful. The question is, what does this do to your heart? What does this do to the inside of you? When you think about Jesus, and you think about all that he has done for you, and all that he has for you, to think that we are forgiven, that we are forgiven of every lawless deed, of every iniquity, of every sin, past, present, or future, we are forgiven. We are the redeemed. We are the community of the forgiven. It's wow. So heaven, heaven is the community of the forgiven, and the church is the community of the forgiven. We are the forgiven, so we become the redeemed. Our redemption is in His forgiveness, in His gracious pardoning of our sin. It's amazing. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So what stops us from moving towards God to gain our strength? What stops us? What hinders us? What keeps us afloat on the waters? What hinders us from diving down deep and feeding on the goodness of God and, and just gorging on His grace and His faithfulness towards us? What hinders us? Well, I want to say to you one of the biggest hindrances, and this morning and this through this week as I prayed, I just felt God lead me into this, but one of the biggest hindrances, if not the biggest, is unforgiveness. It's Unforgiveness. So I was thinking about unforgiveness, and I was thinking in this way. It's just a toy gun. It's nothing. It's just a blank piece of wood. But every person in this room this morning, you have been hurt, and you have been wounded by friends, family, and enemies alike. You've been lied about. You've been cheated on. You've been dishonored. Maybe in your home, maybe in the workplace, wherever it may be. And probably everybody in this room is going to be able to identify with my next illustration. That when there is somebody who has grieved us and hurt us, then we plan their death. We have had moments when we have, I don't want to shoot anybody, when we have, <laughs> when we have lined them up, we've scoped them out. Oh, it's been premeditated. In fact, every, we, we prolonged the pulling of the trigger because it just felt so lacquer. We were angry, frustrated, in some instances, justified in our anger, in our revenge. And we've shot them. In our mind's eye, we have, we have planned their death. We have seen them suffer. We have seen them get their own medicine. Hey, isn't that a lovely idiom for us as people? Hey, don't worry, they'll, they'll eat their own medicine. They'll, they'll, they'll eat the same meal, pal. Don't worry. Muni warini, pal. Dit kom. The problem is, when you hold this gun, you make yourself God. Remember Satan, our enemy? The one the Bible says one day when we see him and he stands before us, we'll say, is this the worm that deceived the nations? Remember Satan? The Bible says the reason he fell, the reason he was cast out of heaven is because he said, I will make my throne above the Lord's. In essence, he said, I will become not like God. See, the call for your life and my life in Christ Jesus, in the beautiful, perfecting work of his salvation, is to become like Christ. But Satan said, I shall become God. 
I will sit in his throne. I will raise my throne above his. You see, when we take the gun in our own hands, we assume his role as judge. And we make ourselves an enemy to the righteousness of God. I want to reiterate, those of you that have been hurt in this room, justly so. Some of us have endured all kinds of pain and hardship. Some of us have lost jobs, lost friends, lost money. All kinds of things. But we, when we take the gun in our hands, we make ourselves God. Remember, we are the forgiven. We are the redeemed of God. Can you imagine going to heaven and running into that guy you hate? Hey. Because we do that in checkers every now and again. You've got a thing going with someone, you're running in check, you check in the aisle. You, you, you. Oh, the other aisle. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? You see, by the very definition of being the people of God, we are a people who have forgiven. And because we are forgiven, we are forgivers. What defines you and me as the sons and the daughters of God is that we have given ourselves to love. To love like the Father loves. To do as He does. To be like Him. So forgive, the Bible teaches us. For you have been forgiven. A moment ago, you were celebrating your forgiveness. He was celebrating with joy, shouts of exclamation. Some of you, I check one or two, I just want to get out the chair and just someone do a dance. You were excited. <laughs> but you've been parting like this. <laughs> Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? <laughs> Look like one of those, uh, one of those uh, Mexican, you know, those guys in the... Those militia armies in Mexico, you know. <laughs> in John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, our love for God looks like, our love for God causes us to obey him. We don't obey him for his love, but because he loves us, we obey. I've used often the example of Corrine, and that I love her so much, and that I drink 2% milk and eat brown bread because I love her. <laughs> and by the way, it's done nothing for you, for me. <laughs> That's a problem. But, but we find ourselves doing things because of love. And God says, if you love me, why do we love him? Because he has forgiven us. Because forgiveness from God catalyzed. It, it, it was the thing that set in motion our affection toward him. Because he was gracious towards us. And the measure to which we love him is the measure to which we've understood that grace. And understood his purposes in our lives. And that he counts our sin against us no more. And when we live in that place, we become a people that are oh so gracious. And we are kind and generous. So what about justice? What about the fact that you have been dealt a bad hand, that you were falsely accused, or that that money is owed to you, or that person is a big nachi? <laughs> or that we may be the big nachi? What about justice? God is not a God who is unjust. God is not a God who is not unjust. In, um, in Genesis 13, you can go read verse 15 and 16. God is speaking to Abraham, and he says to Abraham, he says, Abraham, your people, the, you know, the family of God that's going to come out of you, your family that's going to come out of you, they're going to be taken down to Egypt and taken captive for 400 years. And then he explains to him why they're going to be taken captive. He says, because the sin of the Amorites has not yet completed When God takes the Israelites out of Egypt 420 years later, 
And then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So 460 years later, Joshua leads the Israelites into the promised land. And then a little thing that is very difficult for some of us Christians to understand. God says to the Israelites, go in there and kill everybody. And we think, wow, God, you are hectic. But what God said to Abraham was he was essentially saying, I'm going to give the Amorites 460 years to repent. I'm going to give them 460 years to move from their iniquity. I'm going to give them 460 years to not living in their rebellion. And then God brings judgment. And he brings judgment through the instrument of the Israelite nation. And it's tough. Everybody dies because of their sin. The picture is this, friend. Everybody, because of sin, will die. Little advert. That's why you and I must proclaim the gospel. That's, you, that's why you and I need to get on the streets and get into our workplace and our school places and our universities and let people know that God loves them and gave his son for them. You see, so justice is a real thing, and judgment is a real thing. God will judge. He will judge the nations one day. He will judge the rebellious and those who reject Him, those who spit on the work of Christ, those who profane it and, 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 and completely soil it and have one, not, want nothing to do with it. Yes, they will be judged. But you and I are not the Israelites, and we are not the instrument of His judgment. We are not. We are the church. And we are to be in the earth the expression of His love, His grace, and His forgiveness to every person that we meet. We are not the Israelites, and we are not bringing judgment. We are not the instrument of God's judgment. We are not called to picket and to point fingers. We're not a pointing finger, but we're a loving hand. And that loving hand lives, moves, breathes, has it been in the will of the Father. His heart is for the broken. His heart is for the, for, the, for the hurting. His heart is for the unrepentant, rebellious, bad guy in jail. And he sends you there not to judge, but to love. He sends you there to proclaim the gospel, to declare the goodness of God. Look at this scripture in Romans 12 verse 19. God says, beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Don't do it. It's not for you to bring vengeance, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, what we do when we have the gun pointed at our enemy, maybe even rightly so, we have assumed the place of God. I will sit in judgment. But what do we do with justice? I want to say to you, friend, it was wrong, and it's not right. But I want to ask you this morning, will you take the gun from your hands, and will you give it to the Father? Will you do that? And will you say to the Lord, Father, I'm not judge, but you are. And into your hands I place them. With my offense, with my pain, with my hurt. For you have forgiven me, and so I will forgive them. Father, whatever it is that you do with them, that's your endeavor, your God. And I leave them to you. And then you can just pray, save them. Redeem them. You see, because I love that Spurgeon says this too, uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon. He says, man, when people ridicule you and scorn you for being something terrible, just laugh and say, oh, don't worry. I'm much worse than that. (laughs) He's saying, you and I in our sin are horrible are terrible, but Christ has redeemed us, and He has forgiven us, and He has made us new, and every man, woman, and child on every continent and every country is to be afforded the same right to come to life in Christ Jesus. And you and I cannot be a pointing finger, but rather a loving hand. You and I have no right to hold the rifle. We have no right. And unforgiveness lurks in the heart like a cancerous cyst and poisons every part of our lives. And keeps us floating on the top, never to see the grass at the bottom. We're at the mercies of the enemy, moving us this way and that. The thing about sin is that it brings deception. Sin brings deception. (laughs) It brings deception. We, We feel like this is right, but really it's not. 1 Peter. 
I'll just read verse 23. It says, he, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. What do you do when you are reviled, when you are persecuted, when you, you open not your mouth? You commit yourself. You commit yourself to the one who judges righteously. Remember who Jesus is in the book of Isaiah. The Bible said that when he came, when he comes into the earth, that he would not judge by the hearing of his ears or by the seeing of his eyes, but with a righteous judgment, he will judge. He will, he will do why? Because he sees more than you. Every now and again, to my wife's absolute horror, I enjoy reading about serial killers. It's just a very interesting thing to me. And I know there's some of you who have the same problem. Okay. <laughs> it's just an interesting read. But what amazes me every time about those that have given themselves to, it, it's not even vile, it's absolutely absurd. It just goes out on the craze. Is that every single one of those people that have grown up to become serial killers in, themselves have endured horrendous abuse. They have been they have been raped repeatedly. They have been on the, on the receiving end of all kinds of horrendous physical abuse, emotional abuse. They have been neglected. They have been, um, many of them, taken from one foster care house to another foster care house where they were abused. And so hurting people hurt people. My point is, is that God will see more than you can ever understand. And God knows more than we will ever understand now. That person has to receive Jesus. When God cries, you're forgiven, they must say, yes, please, thank you. I receive it. I'm forgiven. And if they don't, then the Bible says in John 3, the end of John chapter 3, it says the wrath of God abides upon them. But that's not our concern. It's not, us for, um, it's not our judgment, but rather it's for us to be the grace of God. It's for us to love people. It's for us to move with Him. Rico, can you just go back to the main slide, the devoted one? So, I don't even know what time it is. It's probably time to end. 10 o'clock. I'll close with the story. Five or so minutes. Friend, you must forgive. You have to forgive. Matthew 18 says that you were forgiven a far greater debt by your Father. And so we're to forgive one another. We have to. You know that uh, Adam, um, Alan, Adam, Alan Simons, Pastor Alan, always used to say, because uh, I just remember him saying it first, when we, when we hold unforgiveness towards somebody else, it is as though we drink poison hoping they will die. <laughs> it's a poison that destroys us. I, I want to say to you, it's in contradiction to the redeemed. Remember the community of heaven or the community of the forgiven. How can we be declare that we are in that place, the forgiven, when we hold unforgiveness? We must forgive the greatest offense towards us because it was all of done to Christ. So on the 1st of, June, or 1st of January 1956, there were um, five men who flew into the Ecuadorian jungle. These five young missionaries had come to share the gospel with a, a tribe, the Wendani tribe. And uh, they, were, um, they were a group of Indians that had, uh, Indians in the Ecuadorian jungle who had never been reached before. Some of you may have uh, seen the movie, The End of the Spear. And these five men, Peter, Pete Fleming, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCulley, and Roger Yoderian, these men flew in and landed on a beach along a big river and they got out and they began to make a little bit of a camp and they wanted to stay and begin to share the gospel with the Wundani tribe, who were a very, very violent tribe. In fact, what they did was if they had no rules, no laws. But if you killed me, then my family were to kill you. And so many of these families in this tribe had spent hundreds of years killing one another. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And so they knew the threat that they faced. And so they landed on this beach in their little plane, and they spent about seven days interacting with the Wendani tribe. Some men and some women would come out, and they would try and communicate and all these kinds of things. But on the 8th of January, 1956, a group of men came out of the bush with eight-foot spears and murdered every single one of them on the beach. Every one of them murdered. And about two weeks later, 
the American army and some people managed to get down onto the beach to go and collect their bodies. They found their mutilated bodies lying, uh, some on the beach, some had been washed downstream. And when they found them, they found them with guns, rifles and handguns. And not one of them had fired. If you watch the movie, there's a very moving part when Jim Elliot is about to get in the plane and leave to go and land on this beach and his son runs to him, his little son, runs to him and says, Dad, 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 if the Wundani try to kill you, will you shoot them? And Jim Elliot in the movie just looks, leans down and looks into the eyes of his little son and he says, I can't. They're not ready for heaven. I am. It is one of the most stirring scenes in a movie you'll ever see, at least a, a grade three, a C movie, C grade movie. It's not the greatest, but it's beautiful. It tells the most magnificent story. And these men were murdered. Jim Elliott's wife and Nate, Nate, uh, Nate Saint, their wives moved to go and live with the Windani. They, they took their lives and moved into the Ecuadorian jungle and went to go live amongst these people that had butchered their husbands and led them all to Jesus. Led them all to Christ. Every one of them. Because they refused to hold the gun. They said the king has come to bring life. And if my life must end in order for life to come, then so be it. Friend, I want to urge you today that if there is a place in your heart where you are holding on to unforgiveness to somebody, justified or unjustified, I want to ask you, would you give that weapon to the Father? Would you give Him the right to judge? And would you do what has been done to you. You have been forgiven so that you might forgive. Because the moment we forgive, we kick open wide the doors for heaven to invade. When we forgive, Christ comes to redeem. Where he finds forgiveness, he brings redemption. Whew. And the hearts who forgave the Wendani tribe for murdering their husbands, got to bring those men and those women and those children to saving grace, to know Jesus. Friend, maybe your forgiveness, maybe your forgiveness will lead to the salvation of others. Isn't that a good enough reason to forgive? Even looking aside from the scriptures where God says you have to forgive because you have been forgiven. Some of you need to hand over those rifles to the Lord. Some of you need to just say to the Father, today I am handing over judgment in this regard to you. You are Lord. Father, soften my heart. I don't want to hate this person. I don't want to dishonor this person. I don't want to be left floating on the top at the mercy of the currents and boats and getting tangled up in the affairs of life. Father, I want to forgive. Just take a moment and have that conversation with the Lord. Just give that person to the Lord. Set them free from the prison of your heart. Release them. Give them to the Father. I want you to just take a moment and, and say, Lord, I forgive this person. Just name them. Just gently. I forgive them. I release them to you, Father. I set them free. And now I want you to bless them. Speak His blessing over them. If they don't know Him, pray for their salvation just in this moment. You go, where's, but my heart's not in it. That's okay. His is. Let your voice stir His heart. Let your words bring His will to bear in their life. Bless them. Father, I release them and I bless them and I allow you to be judge. Let's release that. Father, as people all through this room have chosen your way 
over their own. As people all through this house have decided to release, to forgive, and to pardon and bless those that have hurt them. I set you free, Father God, in their lives to take them deeper than they've ever known. To experience you in ways they never thought were possible. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command now an experience with you, an encounter with you, to, ex- to encounter your glory, your goodness, and your grace like never before. Father, as the forgiven forgive, they embrace redemption and your glory comes to bear. Father, in the name of Jesus, have your way in every single person here. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Family, love you and appreciate you. Have a wonderful god day. If you need prayer for anything, we'd love to pray with you. But remember, His way is better. Walk in His forgiveness and walk in His grace. In Jesus' name.